and uh, we're just going to jump right in. Everybody ready to jump right in? Okay. Thank you for coming. I would like to now introduce Emerson College's President Lee Pelton. Well, good evening, everyone. I uh, want to welcome you to Emerson College. I'm Lee Pelton, president of Emerson, and I am very, very pleased to, so, to see so many people here for what is sure to be an important uh, conversation. Uh, of course, I want to thank Arts Emerson and uh, the American Repertory Theater for hosting this wonderful and thought-provoking event, which is part of the Citizen Read Project. And of course, uh, I also want to take a moment to welcome uh, and recognize the many members in our audience who happily participated in this project. You know, for the last several years, Emerson and Arts Emerson have enjoyed a extraordinary and really beautiful relationship with Claudia Rankin, a relationship that began in 2015, shortly after the publication of her ground breaking book, Citizen, an American Lyric. And last year, I was honored to bestow upon Claudia an honorary doctor of humane letters from Emerson in recognition of her many achievements and contributions that underscore our own values and beliefs at the college. Here at Emerson, we are committed to excellence, to diversity and inclusion, and to global and civic engagement. These institutional priorities reflect our college's rich history and our hopes for our future. Above all, we are committed to inclusive excellence. Emerson and all that we do is shaped by the diversity of people and ideas and perspectives and beliefs in our commonwealth of learning. And Emerson education is profoundly rooted in creativity and excellence and innovation. And members of the Emerson community share an innate desire to create, to use their chosen disciplines and medium to make a difference. We are the doers, we are the makers. And here at Emerson, we believe in the infinite value of the arts. The arts connect diverse people and ideas and disciplines and shine a bright light on our shared human experiences. The arts help us to comprehend uh, in new and wonderful ways the world in which we live, and it helps to prompt important conversations uh, about our shared and common humanity. Tonight, Arts Emerson and ART provide an important platform, uh, a commons, to make those connections, to re-examine ourselves and confront our beliefs, and most important, to open our minds and hearts to diverse cultures and perspectives that surround us. And at this particular moment in our country's history, I'm sure you'll agree with me that it seems more fitting and more important than ever to use the arts, lift up the arts, and to use the arts as a platform to move these important conversations forward. And to begin, I invite you to enjoy this short video which was created by Claudia Rankin and John Lucas, uh, and now Situation 7. Thank you so much. On the train, the woman standing makes you understand there are no seats available. And in fact, there is one. Is the woman getting off at the next stop? No. She would rather stand all the way to Union Station. The space next to the man is a pause in a conversation you are suddenly rushing to fill. You step quickly over the woman's fear, a fear she shares. You let her have it. The man doesn't acknowledge you as you sit down because the man knows more about the unoccupied seat than you do. For him, you imagine it is more like breath than wonder. He has had to think about it so much, he wouldn't call it thought.
When another passenger leaves his seat and the standing woman sits, you glance over at the man. He is gazing out the window into what looks like darkness. You sit next to the man on the train, bus, in the plane, waiting room, anywhere he would be forsaken. You put your body there in proximity to, adjacent to, alongside, within. You don't speak unless you are spoken to, and your body speaks to the space you fill, and you keep trying to fill it, except the space belongs to the body of the man next to you, not to you. Where he goes, the space follows him. If the man left his seat before Union Station, you would simply be a person in a seat on the train. You would cease to struggle against the unoccupied seat when, where, why, the space won't lose its meaning. You imagine if the man spoke to you, he would say, it's okay, I'm okay. You don't need to sit here. You don't need to sit and you sit and look past him into the darkness the train is moving through a tunnel. All the while the darkness allows you to look at him. Does he feel you looking at him? You suspect so. What does suspicion mean? What does suspicion do? The soft gray green of your cotton coat touches the sleeve of him. You are shoulder to shoulder, though standing you could feel shadowed. You sit to repair whom, who. You erase that thought. And it might be too late for that. It might forever be too late or too early. The train moves too fast for your eyes to adjust to anything beyond the man, the window, the tiled tunnel, its slick darkness. Occasionally a white light flickers by like a displaced sound. From across the aisle tracks room harbor world, a woman asks a man in the rose ahead if he would mind switching seats. She wishes to sit with her daughter or son. You hear, but you don't hear, you can't see. It's then the man next to you turns to you. And as if from inside your own head, you agree that if anyone asks you to move, you'll tell them. We are traveling as a family. Can you go ahead and uh, just bring the house lights up a little bit? We want to be able to see people and have people see each other. Uh, just a little bit. We'll warm it up here. Um, hello, I'm Diane Borger, the producer at ART, joining David for just a little preamble before we get to the main event. Um, it's been a fantastic experience for us to partner with Arts Emerson on both the production of the White Card and also the civic engagement activities around it. So 
I'm formally thanking him. Well, and thank you so much for the partnership, Diane and uh, ART. Uh, we're both delighted, both organizations are delighted to have sponsored uh, this total event, the Citizen Read, and uh, that you uh, participated. I just uh, want to uh, let people know, for those of you who aren't uh, aware of what even the Citizen Read has been, and there may be some of you in the audience, uh, and certainly maybe some of you uh, at uh, HowlRound, I see you guys over there streaming this event, thank you. Uh, the, so Citizen Read has taken place all across the city. We've had 1,300 people participate in 80 different book clubs. And uh, if you could uh, just uh, uh, wave and say where your book club participated. The book club leaders in the audience, just shout it out. Where were you? How, where are you from? You hear that? All over the region. And thank you so much for participating. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, we also have in the house today a number of the facilitators. So what happened was that book clubs all over the city read the book and uh, had uh, facilitated conversations with uh, trained staff that was provided by ART and Arts Emerson uh, to have the conversations. I think there are about 20 of you in the house today who were facilitators of those conversations. Do you want to wave? They're, oh, they're all sitting over there together. <laughs> This is also the facilitation team at the White Card. For those of you who are seeing the play, you might recognize a few of these facilitators for the Act Two conversations. Thank you for your work. It's been an incredible journey with you, and uh, we so appreciate all of your time and effort and your expertise in this conversation. Uh, there are a couple other uh, little thank yous to do. Um, we, oops, I'm on page two already. Uh, for those of you who haven't read it, I just want to let you know it's not too late. And thank you to Nicole uh, Olosanya and to Brenna from ART and Kevin from Air, uh, Arts Emerson uh, and Robert Duffley. The resource materials for the Citizen Read are available online at artsemerson.org. And you can still, in your book club or individually, read the book and follow the curriculum. Uh, you have time. The play is here until uh, April 1st, so you can do it at any point, uh, and uh, it will enrich the experience of watching the play. Uh, and uh, there is no way that Arts Emerson and ART could have achieved the project on our own, so I want to thank all of the teams at both of the theaters, all of the facilitators of the uh, book clubs, and all of the facilitators of the conversation uh, for making it such a vibrant kickoff to this culminating event, Citizens Speak. So it's my uh, lucky pleasure to introduce the two people who are going to talk about it today. So uh, Claudia is obviously here and she'll be talking about, as it were, the journey from Citizen, the Book of Poetry, to the play The White Card. And she's joined by P. Carl, who's been the dramaturg on the production. Um, P. Carl is a distinguished artist, I want to get the titles right, and the residence at Emerson College the dramaturg for the white card, as I said, and also a recipient of the Art of Change Fellowship from the Ford Foundation. Claudia, who needs no introduction, um, is the author of five collections of poetry. She's a professor at Yale, but she's also, with Citizen in particular, won a list of prizes that takes up the whole card. So I told her that I probably wouldn't read all of them, but she won uh, many of the poetry prizes the year that it was published. She won the National Book Critics Circle Award for Poetry. She won the Forward Prize, and she was awarded a MacArthur Genius a Grant. Uh, but for me, she's today, first and foremost, the playwright of the white card. So Carl and Claudia, we welcome you. <laughs> Good evening, hello, hello. Uh, thank you all for coming out this evening. Uh, I um, have had the great privilege this last uh, two years to work with Claudia uh, on um, her amazing play, The White Card. How many of you have seen the play? Okay, just getting a sense. Okay, good. Not so, enough. Not enough, yeah, yeah. I know <laughs> some of you are going later, I know. You're all going to see it, but you may not have seen it yet. Um, and uh, uh, as we were working on the play and talking about um, how to engage um, Cambridge and Boston in the conversation of the play, 
um, uh, I asked um, Arts Emerson and ART about the idea of doing uh, a read of her book, Citizen, because uh, it felt like uh, the Citizen and the White Card, and of course all of Claudia's work is in conversation with itself in a way, and that there would be a wonderful uh, trajectory of being able to uh, read uh, the book uh, in community with other people, uh, then be able to uh, talk with Claudia about the book, uh, and then also be able to read the play, and then participate in the act two conversation that the play offers after the show, uh, that it could really, um, uh, I know, uh, you know, uh, we, we are a community grappling with race. Uh, I, I don't know how many of you read the Spotlight series in the Boston Globe, but uh, I did. Uh, and it uh, uh, was not shocking, but it was uh, sobering, I think. And, uh, and so uh, it's a, it feels like a great time for us to be kind of digging deeper. Um, so what we're going to do tonight, uh, many of you have submitted questions from your various reads, so I'm going to go through some of those uh, questions. Uh, and we're going to start really talking particularly about Citizen. Uh, Claudia, you published this book in 2014. How many uh, audiences would you say uh, you have talked uh, with this, uh, about this book with? Well, after the election, I would say not enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> apparently, apparently. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know. It's been, it's been a gift to be able to travel this country and, and beyond our borders um, in order to hear what people have had to say around... Um, racial dynamics, specifically in the United States. So I haven't counted because it hasn't been a burden, because it has informed me in ways that, you know, before the process, I don't think I could have um, felt confident to speak or to write the white card, in fact. Uh, as we've been working on the play, I mean, I know um, at least every week it seems that you travel somewhere to have a conversation and uh, and it, it and um, and really rich conversations. Uh, I wonder if maybe um, just to start, what are a couple of things that stand out? I mean, as you've toured over really like it's about three or four years now that you've been touring, talking about the book. What um, what are some of the responses that really stand out to you in terms of conversations that you've had? I think I think the thing that um, has most surprised me is how we are living two different realities, um, and I mean we as in people of color because I was also surprised by the number of Asian women, especially, who came up to me and said this book is their book. So there is sort of white America and, the, um, and then the rest of us who are being subject to a certain kind of um, projection. And it, it, it was surprising to me that it was not seen as it was happening. I, um, I thought I'm seeing it, I'm feeling it, and apparently other people are. And yet um, the book for many people was a surprise. And I found that surprising. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I have a kind of, um, I have a, your actual legitimate questions here on note cards that you have asked, met some of you in the audience have asked. So I'm gonna go through some of them and we'll just kind of chat a mm -hmm. little bit and, uh, 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 and then we're gonna chat for um, about an hour. So uh, the, um, uh, one of the questions uh, was, um, if you could talk a little bit about your emotional process writing the book, um, were some parts more challenging to write than other parts, and, and why? The, the, you know, as with most books, you don't think you're writing the book when you start writing. The uh, Citizen began with Katrina, and um, when Katrina happened, many people said, how could this happen? And, and it became sort of an irritant for me because I thought, come on, come on. We, you know, we, 
we know that this, some form of this is happening all the time. Um, but when I did the Katrina piece, which became a situation video, I didn't really know that it was towards a book. But first I responded with my husband to Katrina, and then we began to respond to situations in the culture, moments in um, media that caught our racial imagination. And then I was diagnosed with breast cancer, and um, I was home. And for, you know, for the first time in a long time, when I said no to somebody, they believed me. You know, like there are two times in your life when you're pregnant, you can be like, no, I'm pregnant. And people are like, oh, I'm sorry, that's okay. And the other time is, uh, no, I have cancer. And then they're like, oh, okay, that's fine. We'll find somebody else to do it. <laughs> you just go home and take care of yourself. And so I was able to be home, um, you know, with the chemo and the radiation and all that. But I was home and I was able to sit down and really work through some of these um, situations on the level of language and really without interruption. Every third week I had to have chemo so that I was sick and that I didn't work those weeks. But the other weeks I, um, I was able to really kind of think about um, how stories that had been told to me could be communicated in the language. So it was really that trajectory from Katrina to about 2013 mm -hmm. that I worked on the book. Um, and then um, uh, I know there's a way in which the book is laid out, and you and I've talked about this some, um, uh, about the, uh, maybe in, you can just, uh, you know, uh, expound a bit about the way um, you, you know, sort of intentionally shared each piece of the book in the way that you did and how, how you were thinking about that. Well, I wanted the book to accumulate so that we start with um, um, moments of microaggressions or racism or implicit bias, whatever language you want to use, that come and go so quickly that um, people don't even remember that it happened. I mean, the person who is feeling it doesn't forget it, but the other person who might be saying a thing or doing a thing um, will have moved on so quickly. And so I wanted to begin with those so that we could understand that these small aggressions actually are a kind of complicity that allows for the larger aggressions. So that the fact that um, abandoning an entire community of people during Katrina, for example, could happen, it can happen only because every day these other forms of rendering people invisible were also happening. And they were happening you know, with colleagues and um, at the grocery store uh, in, in small ways. And then when it happens in larger ways, we are surprised. So I wanted the book to build to that. So that's why the situation videos, um, the text for those happen later on in the book. And then I thought I needed a sort of more lyrical section that addressed the internal feelings around what it feels like to be inside these moments. And um, so the more lyric piece ends later. The piece with Serena Williams, the sort of essay, lyric essay piece, that happened very intentionally because I wanted to create a piece that you could look up. The other pieces were um, stories being told to me. I had called my friends and asked them to share um, incidents of, of racist things being said or done to them. But that was still hearsay. And you know, when I was out of college, I, I went to college not far, I went to Williams, and then I was gonna go to law school. And, and so, and I worked in a law firm for a while, and I began to think, you know, this is just hearsay. Why should anybody believe this? So I thought, 
you need to write something where people can look up everything in it. And so I thought about who is being subject to, um, to racism all the time that is documented and that can be shared in our collective imagination. And I first thought about um, Tiger Woods, but he's crazy. So <laughs> I was like, no, he might be subject to racism, but he's also crazy. Um, so I didn't, use, I didn't use him. But then I, I, I remembered Serena Williams, and, and I thought it would be interesting to write a piece that just tracked her history at the US Open. And um, so that that's comes very close to the beginning of the book because I, um, I, wanted people to, I wanted people to say, no, this doesn't happen, and then be able to go to YouTube to prove that I made it up and see that, no, um, this people cannot um, help but project onto black people um, ideas around criminality, animal, um, you know, if you think of everything that's been said about Serena Williams, um, at being called brother, being called um, all kinds of things. And so it's all there. And so it wouldn't be, you wouldn't be relying on me or my memory or my interpretation of the moment. Um, so that, those were the kinds of the decisions I made in, in, in sort of artistically inside that book. Uh, just an interesting, not so interesting note of um, as we were making uh, the play um, and then uh, uh, right towards the end of, um, you know, before the production, uh, Serena came up again because the um, Australian Open was on, which is how the play starts. And um, there is a, a, a white supremacist uh, tennis player from Tennessee who uh, had um, all these things on his Facebook page, and one of them was, um, you know, uh, something derogatory about Serena. So it was like it's it was it, it just keeps going, just keeps going and going, which was um, so, uh, not a fun part about making this play, uh, I have to say. Um, th this is a question. Uh, it's more of a comment, but I think it's a great comment that you can we can turn into a question. Uh, somebody says, uh, "What stood out to me?" about this work was the way in which it used, at times, an accumulation of accounts of what some would perceive as microaggressions to really show the vastness and compilation of such experiences and how that accumulation wears down on one's sense of self. However, even as this intensity built, I did not get a sense of a moment of release, at least not on this first read. So I'm wondering about moment of release. Well, that was the idea that the book you know, when you, when you think about the work of a writer or work of an artist, um, it actually is very boring on a certain level because you are thinking about how do you keep questions, craft questions, like how do you keep the tension in this book going? And so the design of the book in terms of the trajectory of the, the, the book had to do with accumulation of experience so that it's one thing on top of another thing on top of another thing on top of another thing and then a redirect and then more one thing on top of another thing on top of another thing and then redirect and and I want for example the images in the book I spent a lot of time thinking about which images would offer conversation but not release you know, so that the image would be in conversation with the text. And the eye, even the placement of the images on the page had to do with, so the eye can move from the text, move into a different bodily relationship to the text, but not be released from the text. Mm -hmm. And um, so all of that, the, the sense of accumulated assault, really, was part of the design of the book. Um, I mean, down to one of the, the fights I always have with my publisher is whether or not my picture should be on the back cover. And, you know, because they think of you as, um, I love my publisher, 
but I think in the world of publishing, they think of you as a brand, and so they think if somebody sees your picture, they'll buy the book. But I always felt like, no, don't put any picture there because I don't want people to feel like this is my life. I want the book to stand as a, a kind of experience on its own. Um, and, you know, it took a long time to get them to, to say okay to that. But that's, there, and that desire was to prevent the desire of, because I do it as a reader, so I know, so that you don't sort of flip to the back of the book and start looking at me and thinking, oh, I wonder um, how she's doing. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and um, so all of those decisions had to be decisions to maintain that line of tension and that, that experience of accumulation. Yeah, it's interesting when I've talked with people about the book and, and taught it, uh, sometimes people think um, that all of those experiences are yours. Uh, and uh, I think um, the, the effort to separate yourself from that has had to be intentional in that way. Um, so uh, this is, comes from another book club member. Uh, someone mentioned uh, in a book club that they didn't believe, Claudia Rankin, that would be you, uh, presented enough evidence to show that one of the instances she discussed was race-based. This led me to the following questions. I wish I'd asked him in response, if this text was evidence, what was the case, what was the case being made for? How much, what kind of evidence would convince him? At what point is there just acceptance, resistance to seeing? Well, this is the thing. This is why the book is just a book. You write the book from the position of, this is what I know, this is what I feel, this is what's been told to me, this is... Um, This is a life contributed by many people. If the person reading the book refuses the book, that's another kind of decision. And I'm not really a part of that. You know, um, it seems to me that if someone feels the book fails in their ability to recognize another human being's um, experience in life, that's its own position, right? And, and if I were that person, I would then start asking myself, what is it I need from this book that I'm not getting? Because then that's, you know, that's a generative um, question that would allow f for a re-entry into the human experience rather than the idea of the rejection of the thing as a failure. Um, so that's, I'm, at least for me, that's how I'm, 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 I'm always interested in, in what is it I wanted that I feel I'm not getting. You know, I was in London um, at a BBC. The BBC does these, uh, they do these talk things. It's sort of like this. And they do them in maybe November so that people can go on vacation for Christmas. And, <laughs> and then they put you in a room with people and somebody talks to you. And there's a Q and A, and but it's a real Q and A, not like this one where it's managed and you can't really speak, <laughs> which is good. <laughs> but there was a guy in this Q and A, and he said to me, "You know, I read Citizen and I like Citizen, but um, but I don't I don't really find you that interesting." <laughs> <laughs> and, and I said to him, if you would tell me what you would like from me, I will consider it. <laughs> <laughs> because it really is about a kind of performance that one wants, right? 
And if that performance is not forthcoming, it's as much on your desire as it is on the thing in front of you. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to get into this just a little bit in relationship to the white card, uh, because, uh, you know, one of the things, as you and I started making the play, um, and we start talking, and, and you would write things, and I would say things to you like, oh, that's too, that's too extreme, that's, that's going too far. And you would say, oh, that happened last night. Uh, you know, like, and, um, and so, you know, it was, uh, it certainly for me was an education. I didn't come in, um, uh, you know, ignorant to it, but I, I didn't come into it uh, knowing the, um, the constancy of it, uh, especially for someone like yourself who is, you know, by your very presence provoking for people this question of, of race. But the... Um, uh, uh, so every time you walk into a room, people are bring, you know, bringing it up. And, and, and then when we started working on the white card, uh, and you know, this is, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll read this if you, you know, read about the play, um, you know, people saying, well, the white characters aren't believable. Um, and of course, uh, we know that they're utterly real um, and that everything that's spoken in that play has been said. Um, and so what, like, I, that question of convincing, like, how is it that, um, you know, in every circumstance, it is this kind of choice to distance yourself and to say those things aren't believable and to, um, and to really um, uh, kind of stand by that. And I, I've, I've just found that very curious. Like, what are real people then if these are not real people? Like, um, and why can't white people believe how white people behave? <laughs> I, I find that um, that's been a really curious thing uh, to witness through the course of the play. Well, yeah, I, you know, it's such a hard, um, it's a hard thing because I've been thinking about that in the course of making the play. I, I mean, you know, I, it's anecdotal, but um, just a couple of weeks ago I was at a dinner and, um, and I was flanked by these two women, very nice women, very nice women, very very important women in our community. And, um, but one of them said, I don't understand um, why white people are so racist. Um, these are, you know, she said, um, it's probably reverse racism, but I think black people are superior to white people. I mean, they're great athletes and singers. They have a lot of rhythm. I did not make that up at all. I mean, when people think I make this stuff up, they give me too much credit. Yeah. <laughs> they really do. And then the woman on my other side, she said, well, there was a woman across from us, a white woman across from us, and she started going, um, oh my God, what is she saying? Oh my God, what is she saying? Which I thought would be a really great, um, like, chorus. <laughs> Some backup singers, oh my God, what is she saying? Oh my God, what is she saying? So she was, you know, and the woman just kept going. She's like, no, they're great singers, great, great singers. Some of our greatest singers are, are African Americans. And... Um, so this happens, and then the woman on my other side, she says, you know, Claudia, white people are very racist. If I told you some of the things I thought, you wouldn't believe it. And I'm eating dinner between these two women. <laughs> you know, I'm like, okay, this is, let's go. This is our evening together. Um, I can't make this stuff up. I cannot make it up. I would be, I would deserve something better than the MacArthur. <laughs> but so, you know, so when people say to me, this is not believable, I think what they're really saying is, I am not in the room with black people ever. <laughs> and 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 scene right. Um, uh, another person uh, who is in a, a, a group. It is difficult for me to even have this kind of facilitated conversation in such a white-dominated group 
where for most people, these are shocking, horrific lessons, and where for me, this is daily life. How do you navigate this kind of situation? Well, you know, the world is um, full of white spaces, and um, I, you know, I can't remember a time in my life where I have not been in spaces that were dominated by white people. Um, you know, I went to Williams College, I loved Williams, but hello. You know, um, I went to Columbia, I had a great time there, but hello. Um, I taught in institutions where often um, I was the only black faculty member. I remember one job where I, I said to them, look you people, I'm a poet, you better just hire yourself an African Americanist. You can't have me doubling up. <laughs> I, that's not what I do. You could hire one of those people. Um, so that has been my life. And inside that life are also just people. So I have had very good friends um, who are white. I have had um, very good friends who are black or Asian or Hispanic. Um, but in terms of institutional power, we have all been aware of the fact that we're inside white spaces and that those things are being privileged. And it, like every, every moment, you're clocking these things and they're subtle. I remember once going to a dinner party at the chair's house um, at, um, at a university where I was teaching. And when I got there, the, his wife said to me, would you like to see the house? It was a very nice house. It was, if you think large is nice, it was nice. And, um, and I said, sure. And I looked around at my other colleagues thinking they would come too. But nobody moved. So I stood up and then I realized, oh, you all have been here before. And even though I've taught in this department, for over 10 years. This is my first visit to the very nice house. My first invitation. So it's moments like that. Like it takes a second, you're like, aren't you coming? We don't have to. We know where every room of this house is. So, you know, it's those moments and you're just, you, you clock them, it's not, you know, she, she had good colors on the wall. You know, it was nice, it was nice. but. I just, I, I think, I think, you know, my husband is white. My daughter is mixed race. She just started a, a club at her school for mixed race children. I, I think we're negotiating these spaces, and these spaces are what they are. And I think if we begin, this is my own personal feeling, if we begin to call out the problems within the space, we will begin to see them. Because I think everybody is culpable, no matter their race, in allowing things to stand. And that's part of why they have stood. Um, I also know that I am in a privileged position that my job is not on the line when I'm like, hey, what are you doing? What are you saying? Um, I, I have colleagues who say I would say something, but if I said something, it might affect my tenure. Um, so I understand that it's a complicated dance inside these spaces that are dominated by white people, that are um, where the habits of whiteness are maintained and perpetuated, and so constant that they seem normal. I was, you know, I was once at a hiring 
And um, a student said about a candidate who was not white. He said, I don't, you know, I don't think he's a good idea because he doesn't, like, it's not what I'm used to. He doesn't sound like the other guy who I, who I feel like speaks in the way that I'm used to, reminds me of myself. He said that. And so I said, hey, do you hear what you're saying? You're saying, because you see a reflection of yourself, that's what we should hire. No one else said a thing. And then a few days later, that student knocked on my door and he said, I've come to apologize because another faculty member said uh, that I made you angry. I said, you didn't make me angry. You were just being racist. <laughs> um, you don't have to tell the story if you don't want to, but I, I'm curious. The story that's in my head now is the one uh, about um, that award that you got and the story that was told about family, but if you, I, I don't, I don't want to, like, I, 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 that one is in my head for some reason, and it's such a great uh, story about, um, I mean, just this idea of how people, how white spaces are controlled that way, it's a, uh, it, it comes to my well, head. Well, um, Carl has been, you know, uh, we're working together for two years, so every time I come back from an event, I'm like, Carl, guess what happened? <laughs> <laughs> I, I know a lot of them, so I don't want to reveal yeah. ones you don't want to reveal, so. But, um, but I did get an award, and um, and at the ceremony, the 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 award was endowed by a very wealthy family, and the the man got up and he said, he said, you know, race has always been important to us. Um, in our family, there were four, did I say four? Five of us. There were five of us. My nanny was an important person in our family. And that person has, um, you know, been like another family member. So Claudia, we're so happy to give you this <laughs> And you know, it's like, is that associative? What? You know? <laughs> I feel like I should go with the shrink, you know, with the shrink with me. And, <laughs> and that, that scenario has happened many times when I have received award. I, I finally got to the point where one man said it to me, not on the podium, but next to me at dinner, he said, he said, you know, um, I, you know, we, we have always had black people in our family. Um, I grew up with a woman who, who took care of me like my mother. So, and I know I shouldn't have done it, but I said to him, do you know any black people you don't pay? <laughs> And he said, what? <laughs> um, it, it also makes me think a little bit about, um, as we've uh, been working on the white card, and uh, you know, some, some of the people who have read it, uh, particularly um, maybe a little bit younger generation, have asked, um, so the play, for those of you who haven't seen it, I won't give too much away, but um, uh, is about a, a, an African-American artist who goes to the home of a um, white uh, philanthropist and art dealer and, and has a dinner. Um, and, uh, um, and many people have said, oh, um, uh, Charlotte's the character's name, Charlotte would never, uh, she would have never stayed in that room with those people. And, um, and I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about that, because that was a response we didn't really see coming in a way. Yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah, we had many black people say, um, I would have left. This, this is not realistic. 
if I were in a room and people were talking to me like this, I would have left. And it was, it was curious to me because I have never been in a room where any black person have, you know, walked out if it was a job interview or if it was something where in some way their life would be extended in some way. So I think, I mean, it could just be me, but I, I found that perplexing this notion that there is an alternate reality where you are able to negotiate a life without negotiating whiteness and racism. And that one can just walk out when, um, when these things happen as if we don't have 401ks, as if we don't have mortgages, as if we don't have health insurance attached to these institutions. So, I mean, I, 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 I like to think of myself as standing up for myself, but I also know I have a child at home. You know, I, I want to have a roof over my head. So as a person of color, yes, you're going, you know, I feel one negotiates these spaces. And then at some point you do make decisions and there are things that are not tenable. But often that decision is not made in the moment of the act. Uh, so another question, uh, how do we acknowledge that our historical selves are in the room when our entire relationship is based on agreeing to pretend that only our self-selves are in the room, that only our self-selves exist for us? Well, I think, I, you know, I think that we need to pay attention to what we say. I had a really um, embarrassing moment. I was giving a talk with a, at a college, and this, um, this African-American student stood up, and she said, I read Citizen, and... Uh, and I understand why people like it, um, but none of the stuff that happens to me is in your book. And so I said, well, what kind of things happens to you? And she said, well, for example, you know, when I was in high school, my mom used to pick me up from school and bring me to my grandmother's house and she lived in a white neighborhood. And, um, and then my mom went to work until midnight. And at midnight, she would come to my mother, her, her grandmother's neighborhood to take her back to their house because the school that she attended was closer to where they lived. And, um, and she said, at least once a week, the police would come and my mother would be on the floor and handcuffed and my grandmother would have to go outside and tell them that she's here to pick up her daughter. And that happened a lot of times, but I don't see any of that in your book. And first of all, it just broke my heart that that was her reality. Secondly, it's not in the book because it was never my reality. I never even knew that that was a possibility for a child just going to school while her mother, her single mother worked. I mean, I know it intellectually, but I, I didn't know it as a day-to-day -day kind of thing. And it wouldn't have been in the book because the book specifically was about a certain kind of class relationship. But still, it felt like a moment where I had failed her. And so, what was the question? I forget. Oh, uh, <laughs> so when we're in a room, we, um, how do we acknowledge that our historical selves are there? Right. Um, even though we try to feel it, it's only our self self there. And so even though I understand historically how possible that 
dynamic is for her. I know that. I know that those things happen. My self-self, Claudia in the world, that's not my life. And, and I forgot to extend the book out to her. Like I forgot to move it into an arena where she would feel held by citizen, by virtue of holding scenarios or even asking um, people who have been in her position to tell me their stories. So I think we're, you know, we're always coming up against the limits of our, of our self-selves as we negotiate intellectually our historical selves, at least I find that for myself. Um, and then the flip side are people who feel like their self is their historical self. And I, f I find that that's true often for white people. They think I'm a good person, so, so historically, whiteness is good. And they can't separate the fact that there is a history and a reality that is not their actions, even though their actions are made possible by that history and that reality. Um, and, you know, so we, I think we, it's really about having a kind of consciousness about what is really the history, not the history you want to have, but what is really the history, and how you as an individual are, negotiate spaces with that knowledge. I mean, I'm very conscious in my classes now about DACA and about students who might be undocumented. I mean, that's something I hadn't really thought aggressively about over the years. And, but now I cannot sit in the class, I cannot make a list that does not include that as a possible scenario for someone in the class, even though I don't know their particular histories, even though that's something that goes un unnamed. But I do, I do think, okay, historically, I know that this is possible for someone in this class. And as an individual, I want to be accountable to you. So it's, you know, it's a, it's a, and we're always going to leave things out. That's why I told that story earlier. We're all, always going to fail. We are going to fail. We're going to fail as human beings. By definition, the word human being means to fail. I mean, not really, but, <laughs> but by, by experience, we know this is true. And um, so, yeah. It's, there's no answer to this question, I guess is what I'm saying. I think we're constantly negotiating and coming up against the limits of, of um, what is institutionally true and what we want for ourselves in our interactions with others in the world. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that's been so interesting in that question, I guess for me, as somebody who's um, uh, been w w traveling with you and talking about the play and being in rooms and rehearsing in various workshops and different audiences, and um, I think, <laughs> this is going to sound ridiculous, I suppose, but I'm always surprised at how unaware people are of their, of their historical selves. And I, I have said kind of jokingly a number of times, like, I don't understand in particular why white men don't at least fake knowledge of their historical selves when we're talking about this play. Um, and, and in a weird way, like, they take over rooms, they're the first to say something in the topic. Like, there, there's a kind of uh, lack of awareness of historical self that um, has taken me by surprise because the play is literally kind of putting it in your face or the book is kind of putting it in your face and that would, you know, for me it gives me sort of a pause. I think, well, I'll pause and, and think about that. And um, I think whiteness, my experience at least, again, in this, uh, in this context has been that um, uh, white people very rarely take account of themselves historically, um, and people of color much more often think about it. Um, so, uh, and that has, it surprised me because, I, like I said, I... I I, I think, oh, at least fake like you would, like fake it, like, you know, be quiet or something, and it doesn't, it doesn't happen but then, that way. But then you wouldn't be a white man, you know, like, yeah. you know, <laughs> like that, you know, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. been great, you know, be, I've been married for 25 years, and my husband is 6'2", 
blue-eyed, previously blonde-haired man <laughs> when he had hair. And it's been, it's really kind of, sometimes I just marvel at the way in which he can just move through the world and how people, and not just other white people, black people too, are like, welcome, come in, thank you for being here. It's, it's, it's incredible, it's really, it's, it's really, so no wonder, I mean, not my husband, my husband is very conscious of his, his um, privilege, but um, it's no wonder that some men don't question, because the world, you know, it's like, I have had situations where um, we've been on vacation in like, uh, you know, the Caribbean, and, and the black staff will treat me, they'll give me like a broken chair <laughs> to go on the beach, but when my husband comes down, suddenly he's over there in a cabana. <laughs> I'm like, I need to travel with you, apparently. I need to, like, I can't go earlier because then I'm going to get the broken chair. Um, and this, this from other black people. So, you know, I think, I think if, if, if white men um, are feeling their power, it's because they have the power. Um. Uh, another question uh, from the book club. Uh, let's talk about what happened after Citizen. What shifted for you after, after the book? Well, I think, um, you know, I wrote Citizen and I was thinking a lot about how do, you, how do you make tangible things that are invisible to many people. Um, even, you know, even sometimes the black people. Um, because, uh, you know, after I wrote Citizen, I was in D.C., and this black woman, older black woman, came up to me, and she said, she said, I, I, she wouldn't look at me. She just came up to me, and she said, I, um, Ms. Rankin, I want to, I read Citizen, and I want to apologize to you because, you know, for years I've been watching Serena Williams, and I have felt embarrassed by her. I have felt like she is just acting out in public and making black people look bad. And it never occurred to me that she was responding to something, that she was actually fighting for her life out there. And I can't tell you how ashamed I was when I read your essay. She actually hadn't read the one in Citizen. She read the one in the New York Times first, and then she read Citizen. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I think that there is, I, I don't know, I think that we are all, struggling to come up to speed with our ability to empathize with other people. And, um, and, and this, I think, is, is when it comes to people of color, I think there, we went through a generation this is why, you know, like that Black Panther movie, movie even though it's not that, I mean, I shouldn't say that. Okay. <laughs> Maybe I'll just restart that question. <laughs> so sometimes you get talking and you say things. But, but I think that even though that, that movie, I have some questions about it, let's put it that way. Um, I think that this this sense of coming into a reality that has a history, a real history, and that you are using that history and know that history and are trying to keep it present as you are being yourselves and dealing with other people. I think that that is probably the hardest thing. And, and we are kind of fucked up as a culture because the history has been suppressed for some of us. 
for many of us, no matter our race. I don't, you know, I think this actually goes beyond race. I think it's, it's, it's about um, what we were taught in schools. And do you know something really um, interesting? I just learned this. You know that African American Museum that opened in Washington? That everybody's like, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread? That museum was supposed to be a slavery museum. Speaking of history. And they thought that was too depressing to call it a slavery museum. And so the fact that it becomes an African-American museum is the compromise. Because we can take a history like that, but we can't take a history that comes from slavery, which is the history that we have to, to think about. I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit rambling now, but I, this is what's wrong with my inside of my head. It kind of, kind of shoots all over the place when, when I start thinking about any one thing. Um, you know, speaking of that, though, uh, in terms of the museum and then um, uh, the Brian Stevenson uh, piece uh, that you and I read recently, and then um, you uh, uh, quickly inserted some, a piece of it in the play, um, uh, in the white card, um, about uh, a couple things that he says in that article. Uh, one, that African-American people have never been human, uh, and, um, and that the other um, is that um, the North may have won the war. This is a line that you uh, quote uh, him in the play. Uh, the North may have won the war, but the South won the narrative. And I just wondered if you could, you know, expound on that a little bit, because I think we were both just like, it was, you know, right. so moved by it. Yeah. Well, the thing about the, um, right now I'm in a struggle that has nothing to do with the play. Um, I was supposed to write a piece for the New York Times, and I started over Christmas to write the piece, and it was on Afro-pessimism. Mm -hmm. And the idea behind Afro-pessimism is that <coughs> black people should not involve themselves in civic or social dynamics in the United States because anti-black racism is part of the foundational structure of this country. So that no matter what I say to you, no matter who I am, no matter what I do, no matter what I write, no matter what play you see, ultimately, I am not human to you. And that, that's what Afro-pessimism claims. And so I, one of the founders Frank Wilderson, and I, I called him because I was going to write this piece, and I called him and I said, uh, I said, do you really believe that? Do you believe that black people are not human? And he said, yeah, I believe it. And I said, but I am human, and you're an human. So how can you make that statement? He said, well, because white people are in power and they don't think you're human, so you have no agency. And I said, but what about you? You work for an institution, you have a job, you have a lot of agency. He says, I have it because it was given to me, but it could be taken away from me. I could be killed tomorrow because I'm black. So how is that me being human? And it really, after that, it was a very frustrating conversation with this man. Because um, we kept going back and forth. He, he said, Fano says, you know, the gaze of the white man is the gaze that has turned you into something that is an object. And I said, yeah, but I don't live through the gaze of the white man. I, I have a life, I can be happy, I can be sad, I can have... He said, you're naive if you don't think that's how you're living. And that's how the conversation went. And I was supposed to write this article on Afro-pessimism. And so I was thinking a lot about the thing that really irritated me about him was he said that, for that reason, I don't vote. He said, I'm not interested in being involved in a civic and social system 
that does not recognize me. And I said, so you're telling you know, people not to vote? And he said, I'm, I'm telling people I don't vote. You can do what you want. And that phone call rattled me. Because when I went to write the piece for the Times, every point I tried to debate on the other side, it came down that he was right. He was right. Institutional racism, mass incarceration. Um, what is the thing that just happened yesterday? Uh, I forget which, is it a federal or state law that um, an employer can deny you employment if you have dreadlocks? A hairstyle, people. Um, so, Brian Stevenson, to get back to your question, um, the North won the war, but the South won the narrative. It, the narrative is what has driven legislation. It has driven mass incarceration in this country. I was in Boston waiting for the train at, at South Station to go home, and I didn't hear it this last time, but the last time I was here, it said, um, it said, if you see something, say something. But remember, seeing something is not seeing a person. It's seeing an action. And I thought, oh, you have to remind your people. Because for them, seeing a person is seeing something, is seeing a thing. I mean, that's what it's at. And it, it's cognizant of the history where black people and people of color are not considered human. So I think when, you know, it, that's why when I read that article by Brian Stevenson, it's, it's depressing, but it's true. The South won the narrative. They won it. And it has determined my possibilities in this life. You know, my daughter goes to a private school and she decided she was gonna run for um, president. And my husband and I, when she told us over breakfast, she said, I'm running for president of class. And my gut reaction was to say to her, you're not gonna win. And I didn't do it. But I said, great, sounds good. And then my husband looked at me, and, and so I said to her, hey, if you win, what happens? And if you lose, what happens? She said, if I win, I'm president. If I lose, I'll run for something else. And I felt better. And then, um, and then the results came, and she came in second. And I said to her, so who won? And she said, I'm not going to say the name in case it's your kid. But she, <laughs> she said the name, a boy's name. And I said, oh, you know him? And she said, uh, he's a football player. I don't really know him. I said, what kind of football player is he? Is he like a Tom Cruise football player? I don't even know what that means. Why did I say that? I don't know. <laughs> And she says, no, he's, he's tall and blonde. And I said, uh, so how was his speech? And she said, it was good. He gave a good speech. It was funny. And I said, well, um, how was it compared to your speech? And she said, well, you know, Mom, my speech was like, I'm going to do this for you, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to work hard. But his speech was kind of funny. It just like said stuff that was funny. And I, I laughed when he gave his speech. And that was it. That was the end of our conversation. But then I was thinking about it. And I realized that that guy, who was probably a great kid, he could make jokes because he was already assumed. 
to be competent, to be a leader, to be in charge. And my daughter had to go up there. She came in second, so she's still on the council, so you know, don't feel bad for her. But, um, but she had to prove that she could actually do the job. And that, you know, that, it's, a, it's a silly little story, but it is, it is about that thing of having to prove that you're human, that you're competent, that you're capable, that you're here. And that guy didn't, you know, he didn't have to prove that. He, he made a joke about, um, um, I, I, actually I can't tell you a joke, because if I told you a joke and he was your kid, you would know. So I won't tell you the joke. But um, yeah, so, so the South won the narrative. And it shows up again and again and again and again. Uh, yeah, I mean, just kind of a final comment question uh, as we're kind of running out of time. But, um, I, I, you know, one of the things that, that we were talking a little bit about uh, last week as we were um, in previews for the play, you know, having to contend with um, uh, what I was talking about earlier about the believability of the, um, of the white characters. And we were having a kind of late night conversation about that. I was with the director and you and I talked about it earlier in the day and trying to figure out um, one of the comments that was made in the play, one of the comments that someone made was that um, a, a, a good hearted white philanthropist would not also be invested in the real estate of prisons. And so we were trying to decide, should we address that in some way? Or, you know, like how do we respond to the white resistance of the play? and it, it, up on my, you know, news feed came an article from the Washington Post saying that, um, you know, according to the economic indicators, uh, life has not gotten better for African Americans in this country in 50 years. And, and it was in that moment that I just, you know, uh, texted you all and was like, so there's this, and that's why we're doing the play. Um, and, uh, uh, and so I, you know, I just, I think, uh, you know, you and I talked a little bit about that, but I just wonder kind of, you know, in that world of black pessimism or, you know, where is the optimism in, a, in an article like that? Well, I think um, to go back to the other question about the likability and the probability of the characters in the play in real life, I mean, I think a lot of white people felt like, um, or they, they use this idea that the wealth of the characters means the characters are not them. And that um, Charles's um, investments or the building of prisons is not something they would do. And the reason it's there is because, in fact, if you have a 401k, you, many of the investments are clustered. And if you start to take them apart, we're all invested in everything. So this idea that just because you can name the thing and you personally did not build it, that means you're not culpable or invested, seems to me like a, a limitation in the imaginative possibilities of reality. Um, you know, I, when I read or when I go to theater, I don't think, if I don't line up exactly with that character, then the character obviously has nothing to do with me. I, I find that a really interesting way to um, assess what's, what, what one is interacting with, rather than um, thinking about the metaphorical um, ramifications of any, any construction in front of one. Which is not to say that I couldn't fail. I, I mean, I fail all the time, so maybe it's, it, 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 it is a um, bad characterization. That's also on the table, but it, it's curious to me, this notion that um, if I am not standing in exactly in a mirror of myself, then the thing is unbelievable. And I, I think white people um, use that line of logic to temper their own discomfort. 
You know, I, I, I don't want to have to look at that. I have not been made to look at it anywhere else, so why should I be made to look at it here? Um, but if I, 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 I was on the... I was on a panel once where we had to talk about whether or not we could divest from crude oil. And as we talked to the financial guys and started picking apart the investment clusters, crude oil was just the beginning of it. Everything was present, everything. So I offer that up to those who feel like prisons are too far from anything their, folk, their, their investments would touch. Um, but the other part of your question was? Uh, uh, optimism. Optimism. <laughs> <laughs> optimism. Is that a word? <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I, where was it, where was that election with the child molester? Alabama? Uh, yeah, way more. More and more. I mean, I, you know, black women, thank you very much. You know, I, 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 we live here, we are here. We have had a tradition of opposition in this country that is fantastic. We, everything from um, Occupy Wall Street to Black Lives Matter to what is happening in Parkland right now. Um, we have Brian Stevenson's um, work. We have people on different fronts. We have um, the willingness of, of the people in this audience to contend with the structure that we live under. So I, I think I am fundamentally an optimistic person because I am a parent. We live in this world. There is not another world. There is not another option. We are here together, shipwrecked <laughs> together. <laughs> you know, that's uh, Emily Dickinson poem, by the way. Um, so I, you know, I, I, I think that it feels hopeless at times, but I wouldn't be sitting here. I could be watching the Oscars, and I'm not. I'm sitting here because I feel like our lives are in our hands. We, um, you know, we didn't believe, I believed, but many didn't believe that we were willing to hand over the efforts towards, the inconstant efforts towards our democracy to a fascist regime. and and. And, and we did it, you know, we did it. And now that we did it, we have to face it, and we have to figure out what to do next. And um, if the word for that is optimism, then I'll take it. Thank you very much. <laughs>